Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so we'll get started. I want to be respectful of y'all's time, but thank you all so much for coming here this morning. And um, we just want to provide the public with an update on Fris the Frisco Park renovation. There's a lot going on downtown, and there's been a lot of questions come up. Um, I do want to go through just who we all have who we have with us today. So I'm going to say your name and your position and who you're with. And if you'll just kind of raise your hand so we can let the public know who you are. So we have Anna Watson, Arts and Culture Coordinator for the City of Rogers. John McCurdy, Director of Community Development for the City of Rogers. Lance Job, City Engineer for the City of Rogers. We have Kurt Gober, Project Manager for Napholtz. We have Representatives from Ross Barney Architects, Ryan Giblin, Senior Project Manager, Carol Ross Barney, Design Principal, Misa Inu, Principal Landscape Architect, and then we have David Davis, who's a business owner in downtown Rogers. Okay, so if I'm going to hand it over to John if you want to take it from here. Okay, yeah, I thought I'd just kind of talk a little bit about um, what's going on big picture and, and how did we get here. Um, the, the, the Frisco Park renovation has been a uh, sort of on the books for a long time now. Uh, it, at least it's captured in the Downtown Rogers Master Plan that was published, what, about six years ago or so. And that, that plan was the result of a fairly extensive public input um, session, I mean, series of public in, input sessions involving a lot of stakeholders and partners. Uh, it was uh, involved both the cities of Lowell and Rogers, but coming from those strategic plans and then a more detailed plan for downtown Rogers. And so, uh, but even before that, I mean, improvements to Frisco Park um, have, have been on the to-do list for the city for uh, a long period of time. Um, and so, about three years ago, uh, we decided uh, at the city level, uh, Mayor Hines decided that it was time to start really thinking about how to make that happen. And so uh, at, at that point, we began kind of just conceptual work on what Frisco Park might become. And then through that process, decided to approach the Walton Family Foundation for a design grant. And so the, the Walton Family Foundation has uh, what they call the Design Excellence Program. And what that program does is it funds national, international level design firms uh, to, to come to the region and take on projects. Um, one, of the, one of the criteria for that, for that program is that the national design firm uh, is expected to work in such a way that that increases local capacity for design. So it ends up being a partnership with local designers and, and others to make things happen. And so we, we talked about whether to approach uh, the Frisco Park project as a design excellence award and we did that. And so the way that works is the foundation maintains a list of approved uh, design firms, architects firms and, and others uh, around the around the country and then there's a panel that whittles that down to a handful of, of design firms that would be well suited for the project that we're looking at and so we ended up uh, forming a committee and interviewed uh, quite a few design firms in one way or another but we ended up actually visiting the sites of, of some of the work that, that some of these firms had done and basically got it down to three national firms that were uh, each very fine, excellent uh, design firms that had done major projects around the country and around the world. And Ross Barney was one of the three finalists. Um, and I'll tell you, the thing that, that really clearly put them over the edge and led to us selecting Carol Ross Barney and her team is the fact that RBA has a, has a history and a, and a reputation for really getting to know the area that they're working in. One of our concerns was that we would hire an out of state, out of town firm that would come and, and just kind of bring their idea of what worked really well in some other place and stick it down in the middle of downtown Rogers. Um, but from the very beginning, Ross Barney emphasized that they would come to town and, and do a, a, a lot of work to understand the history of Rogers, the history of that site, 
and then spend a lot of time talking to Rogers citizens and stakeholders and understanding what the people of Rogers uh, needed for that location and what would make sense for Rogers. And, and all the, you know, all the firms paid some lip service to that idea, but nobody emphasized it to the extent that Ross Barney did. And I can tell you that as we went through this, um, that turned out to be a very honest um, sales pitch from Ross Barney that, that when we, we started taking their presentations after they'd spent some time in Rogers, uh, they knew more uh, about downtown Rogers and the Frisco Railroad and the history of that site than just about anybody. Um, so it's very impressive how they really got deep into what we, what, what Rogers is and, and maintaining the authentic, authenticity of downtown Rogers. And so they'll, they'll speak in more detail about this, but what we ended up with is a design for a park where every element of that park has, has either historical underpinnings or um, is a, re, a direct result of some input that was made by the public. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of anything in that park that is just an idea that came out of Chicago that was transplanted to, to downtown Rogers. Everything came up organically through the process and I commend them for that. Um, so at this point, we, the design is complete. Um, we are under contract, uh, several different contracts to make this happen. Uh, the Frisco Park renovation is part of a larger plan to work on some of the downtown streets in Rogers, uh, especially Arkansas Street and the extension of Poplar down towards Lake Atlanta and some other improvements to intersections and, and just street surfaces, restriping, uh, parking improvements, uh, increasing the number of parking places in downtown Rogers. And all of this is kind of going on simultaneously and you're starting to see uh, things happen. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of the big picture on this thing. Uh, we're gonna experience some pain and disruption for downtown Rogers for a while. And we'll talk a little bit later about the timeline and when you can expect uh, to see things happen. Um, but that's kind of the overview, Hannah. Um, and if, uh, I guess next, if we could just hear from Ross Barney and they could talk a little bit about the design process and what, what we can expect to see when, when the dust settles and the park opens up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Um, we have some, we have a presentation to show, so I'm going to start that now. Um, and let's see, here we go. And I wanted to start out by saying that um, we have really enjoyed working in Rogers and um, uh, getting to know the town. Um, we've learned a lot. We've learned, we've been there when it's been a um, hundred and what was it, six or seven degrees. And we've been there when it's been snowing. And I think that um, our understanding is really important to our design method and our design process. Oh, now I, I'm gonna have to, wait a second, I have to start all over here. Okay, that's better. Um, our process is so important to us. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Carol, but we can't see your screen. Okay, hang on. I'm still working on it. Is that better? Yes, okay. ma'am, I can see it now. Okay, there we go. Um, so we began the process by asking questions. We needed to know um, the history of the town. We needed to know um, a lot about the site. Those were pretty easy to figure out. Um, what we really wanted to know is what the people of Rogers thought they needed on the site. And so um, all of our process, um, at least our beginning process, was um, aimed at getting those information, that information. And we knew that people participated in, um, in community life in different ways. So we tried to reach out a few different ways. Some of you, I hope, um, were at our community open house on the weekend of May 10th. Um, we met 
for actually in the market building for a full weekend. And it gave us a chance to have people drop in while they visited the market, while they visited downtown, and give us ideas about what they wanted Frisco Park to be. Um, it's true Frisco Park has been there for a long time, but its identity wasn't really that strong. So this gave people an opportunity to tell us what they thought the biggest opportunities were. We also um, asked them through this exercise where people could post his notes on a big map of, of Rogers, their thoughts about nearby places. Uh, we let them put down where they lived. So it gave us an idea of the community and what people thought. Um, in addition to our outward, anybody can be there, community meetings, you know, stop and chat. We also had uh, a series of focus groups, uh, largely with merchants and downtown leaders. And this was important because we also wanted to be really concerned about the economic growth and underpinnings of um, downtown Rogers. One of the things that's been most exciting for us working on this project is the um, excitement and the new businesses that have happened in Rogers, even since we've been coming to town. Um, we knew that everybody, that didn't include everybody, so we also used some um, methods that we've been using more and more to um, survey people at large. And we um, surveyed them both in paper form. You could pick up a survey in um, some of the local restaurants, or you could go online and answer our survey uh, via your cell phone or your computer. And here's a sampling of some of the questions and some of the answers that um, we got from the general public survey. And um, while none of these, not, there's not one question that we said, oh, wow, this is, this is it. This is you know, the answer to what we need to know. But what it did do is it gave us a better picture of how people use the park now and how they wanted to use the park. You can see, for example, question 13, what would you like to see? And then question 18, what type of seasons do you want to visit the park? And while um, there are no questions that were hugely surprising, what this did is it gave us a much finer tuned idea of what we could suggest and what we couldn't suggest for this park. Because the one piece that, um, that wasn't determined and that was probably the most important is the program. In other words, what we were going to put in the park. Um, we started out with a pretty wide range of activities. This um, graphic shows some of the things we thought about. And through this process, through the public meetings, the, um, the focus groups, and through the survey, we came down to a basic program. And you can see those program elements in this slide. Um, these were the things that people felt were most important to accommodate. The other thing though, that we wanted to um, spend a little time on um, were values that we, we, that, we, um, that we felt from the survey. And we were really, one thing that people said to us every single time we talked just about is this is Rogers. This isn't Bentonville. This isn't Springdale. Uh, it's not Fayetteville. This is Rogers. And this has to be authentically Rogers. And um, the design, it needs to interpret authentic Rogers. And so um, the values were equally important to the function. And then finally, the, one of the really big form givers, we just love the history of this park. Um, it is in the original plat of Rogers. Uh, it's not called a park, it's called a, a rail siding, um, but it's there. And it's been transformed by the activities that's happened in Rogers and by its economic and historic growth. This got to be one of our favorite photos. You can see the sort of stray pig that's in the foreground. Um, but what it told us is this hot site has an important history and the future has to recognize that history. Uh, this is uh, the Rogers Station with Apples. Apples was one of the first products that, um, that uh, was an economic success in Rogers. And um, in the end, we recognized that the railway identity for this park 
was very important. It was important to its history and it should be important to the concept. So I'm going to go right into the concept right now. And I'm going to go um, start out by talking ab ab about some of the things that we thought about and some of the things that we want to come through our design. Um, a lot of people uh, wonder why we're calling this the rail yard. Actually, it's called the rail yard because it is Frisco Park and Frisco Plaza. And because we're adding new elements that finally unite the rail yard, reunite the park. And um, in fact, we have borrowed um, this, this Frisco uh, logo as uh, the uh, uh, logo for the park. Um, if, you, if you go back in history, it is uh, supposedly uh, derived from a stretched raccoon pelt. But that's a really good story that I don't think I uh, need to tell it right now. But um, working with our uh, graphics consultant, we've developed um, some graphics that we hope will create the excitement that we felt when we were designing it and serve as a springboard for the park's new identity. So <clears throat> we have been calling it the rail yard, but that's not to get rid of the historic significance of Frisco Park. And actually the railroad park when it's completed will consist of um, three elements and one, the, uh, the first element that I'm putting my cursor on here is what we're calling Frisco Plaza. And this is the traditional Frisco Park. Um, it will be a uh, linear park that works uh, as a marketplace, as a gathering place. In fact, one of our inspirations for this park is a famous painting called Spit and Whittle that's in the city hall. And uh, we wanted it to be that type of space where you could sit um, ha have some quiet time, um, watch people walking by. The second element that was requested and that we have planned in is um, an active play area. There's two components in the active play area, the water stop, which is a, a water play area, and the play yard, which is uh, basically an active children's rest uh, recreation area, play area. And then the final element of the rail yard park is um, uh, uh, a uh, entertainment area. You can see where we have um, maintained the farmer's market building, but we've added to it a large covered area that we're calling um, the Frisco stage. Uh, on this very site, uh, the Frisco stage coach stopped to pick, off and pick, off, pick up passengers and drop them off. And we wanted to make a nod to that history. So this is an aerial view and those same elements, just so you can see them. This is um, First Street and uh, here is Frisco Plaza, the uh, water stop and the, um, and the uh, play yard. And then finally uh, the stage. And, um, oh, I'm going on to go back one second. The other thing I should mention is the park an important element of the park was to maintain the bicycle traffic that goes through it now and to enhance it. Um, this park is part of um, the Northwest Arkansas Greenway and we wanted to um, use that uh, symbiotically. So this would be a stopping spot on the Greenway, but that um, you could also uh, recreationally bike to this and, and access the park that way. So right now, um, the, the bike path will come along the railroad right of way as my cursor shows here, and then we'll switch over to Arkansas. And so this view is taken right in the middle of the park. And um, you can see that you can see the bikers that would be using it. You can see people over at the water stop. I want to talk a little bit about Frisco Plaza, particularly. We, every single space, except maybe the play yard, we want it to be as multi-use as we possibly can make it. And so we have uh, maintained um, some spaces for pop-up um, activities. You can see here, we've recalled a round table and a plaza that is not where the, uh, where the band shell is right now. Um, the space is um, meant to be programmed, um, but we wanted to have a lot of different types of space to be programmed. And then um, in the linear portion of our park, we can 
look, we, th we see things like markets taking place, picnics taking place. One thing that we um, wanted to do is create almost a communal um, dining table for Rogers. In this little sketch, you can see the view from, um, if you were standing at the dollar store, for example. This is a really important entry visually into Rogers and into downtown Rogers particularly. We didn't want to lose that quality. We wanted to enhance it. If you walked a little farther and looked back, this would be your view. One of the things we were really hard on, we wanted to have um, flexibility, but we also wanted to have places where people could sit with their family. Um, we kept on, during design, we called it a community, community table. And the park will contain these picnic tables that you see here. And they'll, e they'll be easy to re be rearranged for different events. Um, what we've done actually is we've detailed them almost like um, train cars where they're on rollers and on tracks. And then uh, this is looking back uh, towards the water stop and towards um, uh, First Street. But you can see the, um, the, 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 what we hope will become the new symbol of Rogers in a sculpture form where people can sit and again, look, watch, have uh, quiet time. This um, photo reel rendering uh, shows what it might look like during a market. I want to show you some of the other parts of the park that we think you'll enjoy a lot. One of the ones we're most excited about is the water stop. Um, Rogers, the first, the real historic historians think the reason that Rogers is where it is is because of the natural springs that are nearby downtown Rogers. What it did is it let um, the railroads uh, fill their water tanks here. And so originally Rogers was a water stop and we've used that as the theme for our, um, our play yard. I think it also probably is a reflection of the um, some of the summer days that we spent in Rogers and looking at the success of activities in this like this around Northwest Arkansas. But we wanted Rogers Water Park to be unique. Um, so when you're there, um, or when your children are there, if, if you're not into getting wet, um, basically the water uh, players will interact with three um, water towers, water stops. And uh, we have different water effects, um, different types of showers, different types of spouts that the kids will be able to play with under these. The second part is the play yard, which is active play area. And this also will be themed about railroads and it will have um, active and exciting um, play activities. The final piece is uh, the Butterfield stage. And you can see that we have reworked uh, the farmer's market building slightly. Uh, what we wanted to do is provide more space for markets and flexible events that happen during uh, the year, along with a stage for performance type events. And so we've reworked uh, the farmer's market building to include more public toilets, but to maintain the concession that is there and make that concession then available to events that are happening. Um, this is uh, the graphic that's been developed for the Butterfield stage uh, area. And this is a view of what that stage um, area will look like. Um, a lot of it will be undercover. Uh, two reasons. One is we wanted to um, make it multi-purpose so that you could use it in, um, in rain or drizzle. But the other reason is we recognize that shade is at a huge premium during the summer in Rogers. And so we wanted to create a large usable public space. And um, that's my little tour through the park. I, I'd ask my colleagues to join in and uh, if you have anything to add about, about the park or about um, our design. No, <clears throat> thanks, Carol. I mean, I would just like to reiterate, you know, how exciting it's been working with everyone. It's really felt like a true collaborative process. And um, personally, I've been really happy to be part of it. And I hope you guys, um, enjoy the park as much as we enjoyed um, putting it together. Do you want me to, um, 
uh, 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 go back to the person view? Stop sharing? I think you can go back to person view, Carol, and we can kind of talk about it. I also want to um, bring the public's attention to the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A button. And if you click that button, if you have any questions about what we're talking about throughout this whole thing, you can type in your question. Um, we did receive one and it was, is there any interest in doing something with the southwest corner of Arkansas and Walnut? John, can you kind of answer that? Okay, let me think about that. Southwest corner of Arkansas and Walnut. So that's the, that is the Amos building, I believe. Um, is that right, Jim? I think that's Mr. Amos's building. So that is a, uh, the, the question is about that large uh, galvanized metal, corrugated metal building there on the corner of Arkansas and, and Walnut. Um, and that belongs, to, it's a privately owned piece of land. It, it's actually the large warehouse, plus there's a, a little space between that large warehouse building and then uh, what I think used to be an old creamery, um, and which is sort of a Quonset hut type structure. That Quonset hut, by the way, has a porch on the south side that will be a porch overlooking the water stock. Um, at this point, um, it doesn't belong. It's not, a, it's not a public building. It's owned by a private individual. Uh, I know that the owner is, has been part of this conversation from the very beginning, and a lot of people are excited about what that could become over time. Um, some of, of one of our design criteria for the water stop has been to ensure that that, that old dairy building and, and that location uh, is, is well served by the water stop so that eventually that could become some kind of a, a, an event venue, a restaurant, something that would be literally a, a porch right there on the edge of the water stop. So it's not part of the city's plans, um, much like some of the historic buildings around downtown Rogers that are privately held the city doesn't have a say in, in what people do with their private property. Um, but my, my belief is that the park is going to make that an even more interesting space, that it could be repurposed, it could be renovated, it could, you know, maybe part of it could be removed and replaced with something else. Um, but it's uh, certainly gonna be prime real estate when, when the park is complete. Um, Carol, would you like to, anything else to add to that? Um, no, I, what, well, yes, I will add, we, um, in the process of, um, of designing the, the water plaza, we, um, looked at potential development strategies in terms of, of, um, floor level and plaza levels and took that into the design of the water plaza. And so I think that, um, any developer who takes it on will find that, um, there's a lot of potential to use or to, to, to sort of add to the park or depend on the park for their development to become part of it. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things that we realized is that this park is happening at a time where there's great activity in downtown Rogers. And so part of the park's role is to spur that on. And so we designed it so that it can accommodate um, some really nice facility on, on, that, on that site. Um, I, you know, David Davis might want to jump in here in a second on this concept, but, um, you know, for, for downtowns to thrive today, they have to compete with, with national, international competitors that are more accessible to people than they ever have been. Um, I mean, I, and, and gosh, especially right now when we're all hiding in our bunkers, uh, trying to stay safe. Um, a lot of us are using Amazon even more than we normally do, would for things that we would go out and buy. And so small local merchants, uh, small local restaurateurs and, and bars and, and things like that are competing against national chains, uh, home delivery, a, a lot of pressure. For that to work, uh, a downtown has to have something that's interesting that creates a more compelling experience than than you would get otherwise with a big box store or going online to order something. There needs to be convenience. And the other thing that you have to have to compete is along with an anchor sort of an activity with arts and culture, you also have to have a lot of people. And so from the very beginning, one of the design criteria or the purposes for this park is to provide 
a, an incentive for more higher density development to bring more people down to downtown Rogers. So if we can even back away a little bit from just the park itself, the, the city is also improving our connections to from downtown Rogers to the site of the future Walmart headquarters uh, near 8th Street uh, interchange on, on I-49 and making it easier and more compelling for the vendor community, the Walmart community uh, to, to have a presence in downtown Rogers and for more people to live in downtown Rogers. We're also doing a water and sewer improvement project to extend water and sewer services east of the railroad tracks so that higher density development can occur over there. So that all kind of gets back to this question of that building. Um, these sites that would either be redeveloped or infilled with new development, um, we, we hope to see more traditional type structures that are multi-use structures, three to five stories that include apartments and, and condos and smaller footprint housing versus, you know, what we see in Uptown Rogers or other parts of Rogers in the Commerce Corridor, which is great big buildings for a single purpose. You need that, that multi-use uh, kind of organic, authentic experience. And by the way, the whole time we're doing this, we're very sensitive to the need to preserve an authenticity about downtown Rogers so that it's not turning into something that's unrecognizable. It needs to be familiar and it needs to feel like Rogers uh, to, to people who grew up here. Uh, David, you're on mute, but do you want to have any, you have anything to add as a business owner of, of how this all fits together? Uh, as far as it all fits together, I mean, we're speaking for um, my two businesses. We're, we're all in. We're excited. Uh, it's, it's certainly been a fun project. And, and now, as you mentioned, uh, with everything going on, it's uh, a fun time. The timing is, is uh, interesting, to say, to say the least. But we've been preparing for this for quite a while. Um, we're, all, we're on board. Uh, it's fun to watch. So there are concerns. Uh, and as a business owner, we have uh, done what we uh, can to uh, kind of make the, the next uh, year, year and a half as, as uh, it's going to be bumpy, but we have done what we can to prepare. So um, I can't speak for all the businesses, but uh, foot traffic is what you want. And we've been here for uh, the rail's been here for almost 10 years now, and I can uh, speak that the numbers have only increased. The amount of people downtown, with all the projects that have been going on, has only gotten bigger and bigger. So, so I, think completing, I think completing the rail yard loop from the Racerback Greenways, Carol uh, mentioned, um, I don't know how many thousands of people, um, you know, during during uh, the summer months or on the Raceback Greenway, but the numbers are, are huge. And making downtown Rogers, integrating downtown Rogers into the Razorback Greenway is gonna bring an awful lot of bicycle traffic into downtown. And those people are gonna be riding from South Fayetteville to downtown Rogers to grab a burger or have a cup of coffee at Onyx or at the, at the uh, one of the coffee shops in, in downtown Rogers. So That's correct. Even last summer when it wasn't open, we saw a large increase in bike traffic. So that's a wonderful sign. We also have a couple of questions about public bathrooms. Can you kind of talk about where the public bathrooms will be located in the plan? Uh, Ryan Giblin or one of the Ross Barney design team? Sure. Um, so what we've done, um, as you know, there, there was the, um, uh, kind of a small restroom building by the caboose at the corner of First and Walnut. Uh, the caboose has been relocated and we've also relocated the restroom. So what you see at the water stop, um, there are two yellow buildings that run parallel to um, the railroad there. Those are new and expanded uh, public restrooms. Um, the other thing we wanted to add there is because we assume that that small children will be playing in the water feature, that there's um, a family restroom attached to each men's and women's restroom. So there's a place where you don't, you know, you can change your kids into their swimsuits and then go play in the water. And then also at the farmer's market building right now, there are two um, single user restrooms. We've greatly expanded the public restroom capacity at the farmer's market building as well. So we think it's a good balance separating them to both sides of the park um, and expanding the current capability and capacity. 
Um, I'll also add that a future phase to this that, that currently is not under design contract is uh, Centennial Park. Uh, we had to demo most of Centennial Park because of some crumbling water sewer and, and utility issues. Um, but we, we are in the process of, of figuring out the, the final design for that and how Centennial Park will interact with the alleyways, which we also hope to, to do some good work on to improve the appearance and, and uh, usability of those alley, alleyways. But Centennial Park, or that side over on the, on the west side, uh, needs, needs public restrooms also. Hannah, what else do we got out there? Um, that's a great question, John. Yeah, so we're working on um, three water towers, which I think Ryan mentioned as part of the, the kids' play area, the splash pad. Um, we're working on contracting three artists, um, hopefully from Northwest Arkansas, to work on those. And we're also working on programming for the stage. Um, we listen to you guys, and um, we know that music is a big interest for you, and we also believe it'll be a big um, boom to economic development downtown. Um, so we're working on programming that for the summer months, the warmer months. Um, and we're kind of at the very beginning of a larger strategic planning process for arts and culture. And there'll be lots of chances to engage um, and lots of time to get feedback and communicate. Um, so we're looking forward to what this is going to bring to the city. Yeah, that, that Butterfield stage, notionally, we're looking at, at every Friday and Saturday night, uh, live music on Butterfield stage from about mid-April to mid, about mid-October. So that would be about 50 music performances. And, you know, we see a, a niche that's really unser underserved in Northwest Arkansas, where we have national level acts coming through the AMP. And then we have folks that you would see, you know, at, at Levi's or, or someplace like that on the weekend. And, but yet there's, there's kind of this missing middle where um, the, the type of acts that you would see at George's Majestic, that, and that's kind of it. And then the, maybe the Meteor in Benville, but Rogers doesn't have that. But yet we have such great bones for live music and a very high demand for live music that's been well documented over several projects. And so a big part of this, pro, of this park project was that the current Frisco stage was practically unusable for a number of reasons, the, not the least of which is that whoever's on that stage is staring right into the setting sun and there's nowhere really to stand and enjoy anything without closing down streets. So by reorienting that over to where the Butterfield stage is at the current farmer's market, it opens us up for a venue that can, that can very comfortably seat about 800 people, but then if we close the street with bollards and extend it towards the play area, we could have as many as 1,500 or so uh, for a music festival. So, you know, think uh, what we could do as, as part of the Roots Festival or Fresh Grass or other, you know, things like that that we can have in downtown. And then during, and, and then Anna, who's a new member of our staff and, and brought in to look at arts and culture programming, um, we're also looking at what we can do during the winter months. We have the Arts Academy, we have the the, uh, the Victory Theater and some other assets in Rogers that we think we can take more advantage of and to provide more performance art for, for, the, the, for the downtown area. We do also have one question. Will groups or individuals be able to host events in the park and will it be, will, does it have to remain open to the public if they do want to host an event? Hey Jim, you wanna talk about um, how, we, how we do set aside time? Uh, Jim White, you're on mute right now. Um, but, you know, how does this work at Clark Pavilion and, and what do you anticipate for this park for the possibility of private events occurring? I think uh, I think if we, we're really transitioning from a situation where uh, as far as like a rental, and I, I think that's what the person is trying to ask, you know, uh, in the past when we rented the Frisco stage or whatever, uh, obviously we were allowed to rent it, but it's in a public space. So at any point in time when that, uh, when that space was rented, I think there had to be an understanding that whatever that purpose was, it was going to still exist in a public space. Uh, we did have some rental situations, uh, through the farmer's market. Uh, that was, that's handled to a different group, to the downtown bunch and the arm of the chamber. I see no reason that 
that could not continue. I think that it's going to be a, a, a situation not unlike some of the others where we've uh, private groups have used it to certain degrees. I think that any time though anything exists in a public space, it's the same as uh, we've had a couple of uh, rentals at the rail yard bike park, uh, Lake Atlanta and the, the areas we do allow to rent. There still has to be an understanding that that uh, you're going to be in a public space and there's it and the idea of a completely private event uh, maybe uh, maybe just say challenging to accomplish. Yeah, if you've ever been to like a major city and walked into a cathedral and there's a wedding going on and there's still tourists just kind of walking around or weddings on the beach, that's, yeah, that's kind of how that works. Exactly. There was also a question, are there any areas dedicated for food trucks? For food trucks? Um, the the multi-purpose space where Frisco Park is, what we're calling Frisco Plaza, but the Frisco Park part of this um, is very flexible. Um, we are putting in power, so shore power, uh, along along First Street on the east side of the street and in a few other areas underneath the, the awning there at the stage, there will be uh, power receptacles to power food trucks or vendor, uh, vendor, I don't know, trailers, things like that. And so we're not creating a food truck plaza per se, um, but we will be accommodating to things like that. In fact, you know, just on a practical matter, one of the things we were working with, uh, the, the, the self-named hot dog lady right now to find alternate space for her to have the hot dog stand downtown, but we're, we're sensitive to the need to be able to provide that stuff. The other thing I'll mention is that the current Butterfly Park is, a, is getting finished right now as a multimodal hub. That's where we've moved the caboose down to the south there by where the Frisco um, station used to be before it was demolished. Um, but we're putting in some EV charging stations there and also power will be available. The, the idea for that space, which didn't come up you know, during the design briefing, is that that's where we can do onload and offload for the, uh, oh, the, the trains that go down to Van Buren or to football games and things like that, that we can use that kind of as it was originally designed as a platform um, you can also do park and ride for the transit. Our, our Ozark Regional Transit stop for downtown will move from the old city hall building to that uh, space once it's finished and it's up and running. And so that ends up being a multimodal hub that will support events and train events and bicyclists. Uh, you can literally, um, when this is done, and this will only be a few months from now, You'd be able to put your bicycle on a on an ORT bus in Fayetteville, take it to Uptown Rogers, transfer to Downtown Rogers, and hop off the bus with your bicycle, ride Lake Atlanta, and then go back. And so that's pretty exciting how we're we're upping our transit game and including Downtown Rogers as a hub for the regional transit network. There's also a question about how they how much the capacity of the stage can handle. How many people can be present for a concert? I think we talked about that, you know, in, in speaking to some of the programming people in the region, I think it's reasonable to expect that on a Friday, Saturday night, we could have three or 400 people, you know, down in that area, and that'll be very comfortable. But for more of a music festival, up to about 1800, is that Misa? Is that right, Misa? I think that you were really kind of looking at those numbers at one point, um, that we're looking at, at comfortably around 1800 if we expand further out to the north. Correct, yes. And, and of course, and that depends on the seating arrangement. And then what type of seats will you use? Or is it um, half seated and half standing? But yes, that was the approximate calculations that we've had when expanded to the north. But if you look at a good, solid, typical Friday night at George's in Fayetteville, you know, they're looking at about 400 people or so they would come and see something and that'll be very comfortable in this space and, and people would be under under the shade area or slightly overflowing at the Butterfield stage. Jim, did you have something to add about parks? Well, I just wanted, to, John touched on it, but there's been a lot of talk uh, recently, and especially in the on our cycling community about this rail yard loop that we're so close to to closing the, the piece, but the rail yard park as it will exist is going to be 
really the centerpiece of that loop. That is going to be the destination loop from the greenway. But one of the things that, uh, that I guess from a parks perspective that we are so excited about in our department is the fact that with all this connection, we're talking about within a few blocks of the rail yard park proper and Centennial Plaza and the things that Carol have talked about within a few blocks of that, we have the bike park, we have Maple Grove Park, we have the museum, we have the Rogers Activity Center a few blocks away in Forrester Park. A few blocks to the south is Veterans Park. And then of course, Lake Atlanta accessible by trail from the park. These, these are the things that we are excited about the park is it's gonna be, it's gonna allow all of these things to be pulled together. And not to mention, if you, if you branch out just a little further from that, all of the educational facilities that are within walking distance of these parks. So I think that, uh, I think just the idea uh, that Ross Barney put together by pulling all these things together, uh, I think it's just gonna be so exciting that it's just not just this downtown few acres that we're all excited about. It's all those things that are gonna be just, I mean, within a stone's throw. So from a parks perspective, we're trying to look at it as a much broader thing of pulling all of these things together. And of course, ultimately, as John mentioned, bringing the Greenway to downtown Rogers. But thank you, Hannah, yes. You're welcome. And we're, we're getting a lot of questions on parking and restriping, if, if we wanna kind of touch on that too. Okay, yeah, I can, I can kind of lead that off and Lance Job, our city engineer, can, can weigh in also. Um, first of all, just with, Parking is an issue and it's, it's going to become more of an issue as, as downtown Rogers becomes more successful. And so, and, and I think we've seen this, um, you know, first of all, with the rail and Parkside Public and Iron Horse, as those businesses became more and more successful, they were using more and more parking uh, that, that spills over, right? I mean, um, I don't know how many parking places are in front of Parkside Public, but it's probably about four or five. And if you have, you know, 20 people in there, that's a lot of cars that are spilling out over into in front of other people's businesses. And now that Onyx has come and they're, they're very successful in bringing a lot more people downtown, um, that's going to put pressure on other businesses that rely on people pulling in right in front of their store. Um, so the total number of parking places was one issue, but the fact that as, as other businesses come into downtown Rogers and they're successful, those, those, that success puts pressure on their neighbors. Um, the other really big issue that we're dealing with is the fact that we've got a couple of dedicated parking lots that are being demolished as part of this pro project, and so we needed to relocate those, those parking places just in terms of total numbers. Um, so one of the things that we did was uh, the work that we are completing now in the Butterfly Park area, which will add, I, I don't know, like I think about 80 or so parking places, but then we're also restriping parking places along streets. And so if you've seen uh, what has happened north of Walnut on First Street, we've already created some on-street parking along that road. And then as we rebuild Arkansas Street from basically from Highway 12 to the roundabout that's at Arkansas and Oak, We'll be putting on-street parking on along that whole way. We're improving and paving Poplar Street to its dead end east, and then connecting that dead end by with a hard surface trail down to Lake Atlanta. And then we're restriping streets all over town. And so, in out of this whole effort, just looking at the 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 Frisco Park area that area that goes basically from Cherry to Walnut and Arkansas Street over to First, within that footprint of the Frisco Park project, we're increasing the total number of parking places by a couple of hundred. Um, and that's mostly on-street parking. Uh, also a little bit of reconfiguration of parking just off of First Street at the very southern edge of the park. Um, then within the whole downtown area by, by fixing the width of lanes that right now that a standard travel lane is 10 feet wide and some of those travel lanes are like 15, 16 feet wide. And we, you know, we have 
five lanes in some areas where we really need three lanes and, and reconfiguring some of their existing streets and putting parking on, we're gonna get several hundred more parking places within the downtown area. But people will have to walk a little bit further sometimes as, as other businesses like are able to come in and, and, be, and be big draws, and, which is what we want. I mean, we want successful businesses to come into town and, and to be successful and to require parking. Um, and, and as we develop and mature as a city, um, at some point we'll be having conversations about how to manage that parking because one of the one of the issues that occurs is that if the prime parking places are being used up by workers or or you know people that just park a car there and stay there all the time, then how do you manage your way through that? Um, I'll also add that we have two locations identified for future parking garages. And so when we get to the point where we simply don't have enough quantity of parking places, we do have sites located that are adjacent to downtown immediate, you know, within the downtown area where we can construct parking garages and add several hundred parking spots at both of those locations. Um, so parking is a big concern. And, and I'll finally just say that the more people that use bicycles or transit, those are people that are not parking their cars on the street. And so as including the rail yard loop within, you know, to the greenway within this plan, and then adding the bus stop, adding a place to be able to get on and off the train for, you know, any potential future passenger service that might connect the downtown areas, then we're, we're investing in a future that is, is a little bit more dominated by mass transit. Um, Lance, anything to add to that? I, I mean, I think you covered the general side uh, very well. I, I would just add a couple of specifics. The uh, mobility hub area, they are trying to get that striped over the next two days, and hopefully that parking will be open by Monday. Um, and then the downtown um, striping, we're working through the logistics of uh, paperwork and everything with the contractor to get that started as soon as we can. We are trying to do a lot of these uh, invasive type um, uh, striping and work right now while traffic is lower so that it will be back open then when when cars are are more out and about you know the the thing with the thing with parking is if let's say that i like to go to hog moth and you know and and i like to be able to drive down walnut turn right into hog moth and and park right there in front as downtown rogers grows and becomes more and more successful it's going to be harder and harder for me to for me to be able to do that. And so over time, I'm going to have to walk a couple of blocks at some point if I want to get to Hawk Mom. Um, we, did, we did a parking survey last year during Frisco Fest, which is the most intense parking event in downtown Rogers of the year. And even at the height of Frisco Fest, we only used about 70, 67% of the parking places, the striped parking places in downtown Rogers. So even though the perception is that we have a huge parking problem, we don't have a huge parking problem yet, but we do have plans to adapt as parking becomes more and more scarce. And we are adding, I, I, I don't know the total number, but it's on the order of around four to 500 new parking places through striping and then the addition of parking uh, on street parking on Arkansas Street and the mobility hub. Um, and then, in the immediate term during construction where we are gonna be tearing stuff up, um, then the Nabholtz and Kirk Gobler, Gober is on the line here with us. Uh, he's the our representative with Nabholtz, but Nabholtz construction is obligated by contract to work with downtown merchants to provide access to their stores. Uh, we can't, we don't want to, but we couldn't prohibit somebody from accessing their property. So throughout the project, there will be ways to continue to access your property. And I know that for, you know, for the rail and some of the other places, we've added mid-block access to be able to get to the sidewalk to make sure that it's not difficult to be able to access our merchants. Going off of parking, John, is there any plan for additional handicap parking towards the merchant area? Y yes, there is. And, and one of the things that actually will reduce the total number of on-street parking places on, for example, First Street is the addition of ADA compliant parking places. And so right now we've only got a couple of ADA parking places in downtown Rogers and they're off street. So we're going to be adding some ADA slots um, at, on each block. 
so that there will be ADA um, accessible parking places. One of the things that we got a lot in our feedback was that we can't assume somebody can walk two or three blocks to get, you know, to, to go to grab a grab lunch or something. And that made us go back and do a full survey of ADA compliance for parking throughout the downtown area. So we will bring that into compliance as part of this project. And will the sidewalks downtown be increased, including Second Street North and neighborhood sidewalks? Second Street North. Um, as a second phase to our downtown striping project, we will be making some hardscape improvements. So yes, I, I don't know specifically on Second Street, but I know that we're looking at some of the areas, for example, around the Second and Elm and, and Third and Elm and that area, and around the old model laundry area where we have some very problematic sidewalks, we're looking at ways to improve those. Um, any other questions? There is one thing that hasn't come up that I'd like to bring up. Um, a couple of things. Uh, there were some questions raised uh, on social media about safety in the railroad and some people were saying, you know, what, why would you do this right there by the railroad tracks? I just wanna address that a little bit. Um, one thing to note is that Frisco Park, and before that, I mean, Carol Ross, Carol, Carol brought up the idea of the Spitten and Woodland Club, and, and you know, I, I had talked to her about my, my old friend Hugh Dryden and, and his buddies that would sit on the bench and they'd whittle and, and chew tobacco and stuff like that back in the day. Um, that area has always just been a wide open field, basically, with a railroad running through it. And so one thing that... Um, one thing that we've been very concerned about is how to make this safe. And so we will have safety, uh, safety facilities as part of this project, barriers and fences and pedestrian controls, automobile controls that we've never had. And so you won't be able to, for example, be at Frisco Plaza and run across to the playground. The playground will be safe. Um, we've looked at, at safety studies around the country of interactions between pedestrians and railroads and the fact that right now when people walk around staring at a cell phone, it's easy to just wander onto railroad tracks and we're putting uh, chicanes in the way so that you can't just wander onto the tracks. You're going to have to look up. You're going to have to open a gate and do things like that. So we're, we're doing some things to make the park safer when it's done than it has been in the past. Um, and then finally, one other thing that has been asked is the farmer's market. The farmer's market temporarily will be relocated to what I think of as the library, but it's the old post office building across the hall from Haas Hall Academy or across the street. And so the farmer's market will continue to operate once we start to do things like spend time in the same space with other humans. But once we're able to get out of our bunkers and take our masks off and go out and go to a farmer's market again. We will be prepared to do that. And, and then, you know, just I, I, finally, I want to say that we're all really excited about this. Um, we've done a lot of, of research and work to make sure that we don't become like that other city, you know, where we're just paying a lot of money to import things that don't fit necessarily. We, we see this as something that's enhancing what we already have. Uh, that does a better job of providing the services and, and experiences that the people of downtown Rogers have just sort of over time evolved to enjoy. Um, we're very sensitive to things like, you know, the, the, the Frisco heritage. Um, a lot of people have been concerned that it's not called Frisco Park. Well, the overall project is the rail yard area, the rail yard district, but Frisco is still there. And, and what you are starting to see with the banners in downtown is this Frisco logo, which will continue throughout the loop. And we're gonna see that all over this park. So I think it's always gonna be Frisco Park. It's whatever people call it. But within that, we're, we're I think, really enhancing the history of the town and bringing it to life. So I applaud the work that Russ Barney's done. Um, and I think it's just really exciting. And I, when it opens, uh, when we cut that ribbon, I'm excited to have live music and festivals planned and, and public art and events that are gonna be a lot of fun and, and just make downtown Rogers an even better place to live than it already is. So thanks to everybody that participated in this and, and Hannah, do you have any parting words or? Um, on the timeline of construction, just really quick. Oh, 
Yes. Okay. Lance Joe, could you just talk through the timeline real quick? Well, essentially the, uh, the overall timeline is it's planned to be done by the end of the year. So, I mean, the whole park, uh, there will be work on Arkansas street. That's going to continue. Um, it's, it's going to right now, we don't have a contractor on board for that part of it, but, um, we're expecting an 18 month time frame on that part of the project. So the park itself should be done in, around the end of the year. I mean, depending on whether it could slip into January. Yeah. And, and as Lance mentioned, there are other projects that will touch downtown Rogers that are going to be going on for about the next three or four years. Uh, Poplar street's going to be renovated to provide better bicycle and pedestrian access to the schools that go down Poplar. Um, the Arkansas Street project will continue uh, to the north and eventually roughly follow the railroad tracks to about where Sam's Wholesale Club is, which is very close to the new Walmart headquarters to make it easier for people to call on Walmart, but, but live and work in downtown Rogers. Uh, and then, you know, we mentioned a little bit about these other downtown Rogers streetscape improvements, resurfacing projects, restriping. So it's going to be going on, but the park itself uh, is if the weather's good and we don't run into any unforeseen uh, snags, we're looking at that to be done by the end of the year. Um, there's a couple more questions that we didn't get to, but I want to be respectful of y'all's time. So I'm going to end the questions there and we'll post a follow up on our social media. So if anybody didn't get a question answered, if they just want to post that in the comments, we'll make sure that we, we get all of those answered. Um, but does anyone else have anything to add? No. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for doing this. I know the public appreciates it, and we appreciate y'all giving up your time to do it, too. Right. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Everybody thank stay you. away from people. <laughs> thank you.